ओम सहना सहन घुन सह वीरवाह तेजस्वीतमस्तु मेषावह Here in these verses, Lord Krishna is prescribing some basic values and attitudes that a seeker of knowledge should have. <coughs> because our mind should be conducive to or comparable to what it is that we are we seek to accomplish <coughs> so we want to know <coughs> we want to know the self want to know brahman want to know the truth and we'll discuss in next verse why it is so and that knowledge can take place in a mind which is conducive for that knowledge 
See, whatever kind of knowledge you want to gain, whether it is physics, chemistry, even knowledge of these material sciences also. See, if you want to know an atom, how you take a microscope and tune up with that object of knowledge, so you tune up yourself with what it is that you want to know. That's the usual process. That whenever you want to know anything, then the method of tuning up will be different. But in this case, through a microscope, through a telescope, through some instrument, you tune up to what it is that you want to see. Ultimately, knowledge takes place in the mind. So you are tuning up your mind to what it is that you want to know. Here you want to know the self. Therefore, the mind should be tuned up to the self. If you there is a telescope in your hand, the telescope should be directed to where, what you want to see. Similarly here, the mind should be directed to what it is that you want to see, you want to know the self. So mind should be inward looking, not outward looking. Self is myself, therefore mind should be inward looking. Self looking, not outward looking. And that's the whole thing here. Usually our mind is outward looking because we've been searching for happiness and, and success out in the world. Now you recognize that happiness or success really is not out there, it is my own self and therefore I have to thus see this fact. I have to see the fact that happiness is my nature. Success is my nature, and therefore the mind should be oriented towards seeing this fact about ourselves. Therefore, what should be done to tune up the mind to the self? Today, the mind is tuned up to the non-self. Now, you have to tune up the mind to the self. In that famous lines, Miravai says, meaning that my mind is now turned inwards. Kathopis also says, Paranchikhani Vitra Swambuhu Ishvara has made our mind and sense organs extrovert. The smart Paranchikhani therefore they are all directed towards external world, towards non-self. Because there is a general conclusion on our part that what we are seeking is to be found out there. Kashchit dhiraha, some dhiraha, some intelligent person, a mature intelligent person, amrutatma mitchan, desiring immortality, recognizes that immortality or happiness or moksha is not to be found out there, is to be discovered as my own self. Amrutta Chakshu, therefore, he turns his mind inward. That's the way of saying, turning the mind, it's not turning something, but then making the mind conducive for discovering my true nature. Therefore, Lord Krishna prescribes this values and attitudes on which we discussed a few yesterday. Asakti, non-attachment. Anabhishvanga, freedom from excessive attachment to the near and dear ones. Nitya, nityo, vastvatishu, nityam samachitatma. Maintaining the sameness of the mind with reference to what it is that I meet, whatever it is that comes to me, desirable, undesirable, maintaining the evenness of the mind, sameness of the mind. And that can be done when I see something same in success and failure. Normally success is not failure and failure is not success. 
So you cannot say success and failure is equal or the same. How can you maintain the sameness of the mind in these contradictory situations? Honor is not dishonor. Dishonor is not honor and mutually exclusive. So thus we come across or confront these mutually exclusive situations. Now success, now failure. Now honor, now dishonor. Now comfort, now discomfort. Now desirable, now undesirable. So our mind jumps up and down. Desirable, happy. Undesirable, sad. Success, elated. Failure, sad. Mind goes up and down. Therefore, there cannot be steadiness of the mind. There cannot be peace of the mind if I keep on reacting to the situations as they arise. How do I discover independence from the situation? Regardless of what the situation is, what the event is, who the person is, friend or foe, how can I maintain the sameness of the mind? the composure of the mind, that I am not influenced by the various changes taking place outside. How can I do that? By seeing something that is common to both of them. Success is not failure, failure is not success, and still there is something common to both of them. What is the common? In success also, same Ishwara comes before me in the guise of success. Same Ishwara comes before me in the guise of failure. What do you mean, Swami? Ishwara comes from his failure, as insult, as loss. I can see Ishwara coming to me as success, as gain, as profit, as friend, as desirable. How can I see Ishwara coming before me as undesirable, as, a, as an enemy, as a failure? How can I mean? Because success and failure, both are the designations of the costume. Ishwara, being a great actor, can put on a variety of costumes. Never, the one who recognizes, who is not deluded by the costume, sees the actor who is in that costume. Just as one actor can come as a king also, as a beggar also. For us to see the same person in king and beggar, we have to disregard the kingness and beggarliness. Recognizing the king is only in the costume, beggar also is only in the costume. But the person who puts on that costume is unaffected by both of them, is it not so? The actor who wears the costume of king doesn't become king by putting on the costume of king doesn't become beggar by putting costume of beggar. We know that he remains independent, untouched by that. Similarly also, Ishwara can put on the costume of success, remaining untouched by that. Or costume of failure, remaining untouched by that. So by appreciating this fact, that what is, is Ishwara. What is, is manifestation of Ishwara. The whole universe is a manifestation of Ishwara. And therefore, in good also, the same Ishwara is there. In evil also, the same Ishwara is there. Good and evil, both of them are costumes. Ishwara, who wears those costumes, remains unaffected by them. So this requires us to be able to Overlook the costume and see the one wearing the costume. Just as when we recognize the same actor in king and beggar, then what we are doing is disregarding the nature of costume. We appreciate what is common to both of them. Similarly also, a bhakta knows that Ishwar alone comes to me as a failure, as success, as honor, as dishonor, as friend, as foe. There is no other entity in the creation, there is only one entity, and that is Ishwara. If there is somebody else, 
then friend and foe can be different. But there is only one. Upanishad says, Ekameva Dvitiyam, one without a second. And therefore, even if I do not see in my mind how the attitude, that is friend also is Ishvara, foe also is Ishvara, success also is Ishvara, failure also is Ishvara. And that way, I can disregard the external form of success, failure, etc. and tune up my mind to what is common to both of them. So this is how we maintain the samachittatvam, the sameness of the mind, the composure of the mind. <coughs> In the last of those verses, which is verse number four, Lord Krishna says, Adhyatmajnana Nityatvam Adhyatmajnana Nityatvam Tattvajnana Artha Darshanam Tattvajnana Artha Darshanam Etajnana Miti Proktam Etajnana Miti Proktam Ajnanam Yadato Nyatha Ajnanam Yadato Nyatha So the value is Adhyatma Jnana Nityatvam. <coughs> Nityatvam, steadfastness. Adhyatma Jnana upon self-knowledge. So one value that we are told is steadfastness in pursuing the knowledge of the Self, or pursuing the knowledge. The idea is that this pursuit of knowledge should become the main priority in our life, the only priority really, ideally. Of course, you know, that requires that you have nothing else to do. Only one thing to do. It is true, you see, that whenever you want to attain success in any field, is it not necessary that I must be totally devoted to that? For studying, for achieving a skill, for whatever it is that you want to achieve in this life, it is necessary that I should be totally devoted to that. And ideally, that should become the only preoccupation in my mind. When you're preparing for an important test or board exam or something, how everything becomes secondary, the primary thing is studying, studying, studying. You eat so that you can study well. Eat only that much that you don't fall asleep, that you remain alert. You sleep, so you get rest, so you can study again. So whatever you do, only purpose is what? Study. 
So we know that whenever we want to achieve success, it is necessary that we should be totally devoted to that at the exclusion of any other pursuit. Here also, ultimately, if you want this knowledge, a stage comes when you should be totally devoted to the pursuit of knowledge at the exclusion of everything else. Right now we are all, we are all pursuing knowledge. But it is not the only thing. There are many other things you have to do and this is one of the things. This is okay. But imagine that you are studying Vedanta, listening to Vedanta at home, whenever you get a time, when you get time, you are contemplating upon that thing and more and more interest is created. More and more enthusiasm is created. You enjoy more and more of that song. I love to listen, I love to think about it, I love to meditate. Suppose you do that, it happens to you. And hopefully it should happen. Then other things lose interest. And a time comes when everything else becomes an obstacle. Swami, I don't like to, I don't want to work, I want to retire, I don't want to do this, I don't want to socialize, I don't want anything. I just want this. When that time comes, then our scriptures say that you are ready for sannyasa. Sannyasa means what? The renunciation of all duties and responsibilities. It's sannyasa. I'm just giving you a whole picture. I'm not suggesting you become sannyasa or anything, but I'm saying how our scriptures perceive this, pursuit. As, and this is our experience also that when we discover interest in something, then we want only that and nothing else. If you love music, that's all you want. If you love to paint, that's what you want. If you love to study poetry, you know, then you, anything else becomes an obstacle. So here also a time comes when you just want to be devoted to this, you want to think about it, study about it, contemplate upon that, because that is what you enjoy. And everything else, oh, how to cook, shopping, packing, traveling, visiting, socializing, everything becomes an obstacle. Your mind says, no, I don't want to do that, I want to do this. So when such a stage comes, then the person is ready for formally renouncing all responsibilities, all engagements and all demands. Because when we are in the life of activity, there are demands upon us because there are duties to be performed. There are duties, there are responsibilities, there are demands, that is fair, that's how it should be. So far I was doing it willingly. Now all these duties, responsibilities, all the things that I did has culminated into this. So when we live life intelligently, then we start getting maturity of the mind, purification of mind. And slowly and slowly, this Ishwara becomes more and more important to us. Scriptures become more and more important to us. Knowledge becomes more and more important to us. It's important now also. But there are many other important things also. Slowly, as you discover <coughs> more and more interest in, <coughs> in this, <coughs> more and more joy in this, this becomes more and more important. Other things become less and less important. Then, scriptures say that you are ready for sannyasa. Meaning that they give us a sanction for renouncing everything. So far, you have lived a life of responsibility, duty. Now that has served the purpose. It has created in you a strong desire for knowledge. 
It is created in you a love for Ishvara, love for scriptures, love for Guru, love for all that goes with the knowledge. And therefore, now there is a consent that if you want, you can you can give all your activities and be devoted to the life of contemplation. So Bhagavad Gita talks about two stages. It's for your information so that you know. Don't feel guilty, just know. So that you know what the whole process is. Lokesmin Dvidhanishtha Pra Prokta Mayanaga Knyana Yoga Sankhyanam Karma Yoga Yogina. Lord Krishna says that this spiritual pursuit is in two stages. The first stage is called Karma Yoga or Yoga, meaning pursuing this knowledge through the life of activity. So Karma Yoga also is pursuit of knowledge through Karma. Meaning you pursue the Karma in such a manner that the very pursuit of Karma is, becomes conducive to gaining knowledge. And when you gain the point where now there is a strong desire for knowledge. When now your mind is ready to be totally absorbed in this, now you don't need anything else to entertain you. We need things to but then this itself becomes a source of joy. Now you are ready for a life of contemplation at the exclusion of all duties and responsibilities. But then they become an obstacle. See, when you are cooking food, let us say you are cooking rice. You need, you put your pot in the fire. Fire is a means of cooking the rice. But once the rice is cooked, that very fire becomes an obstacle and therefore you must turn off that fire. Similarly, this life of activity, karma or karma yoga is the means of cooking the mind. When mind becomes mature, becomes pure, becomes inward looking, then the very active now becomes an obstacle. Because now you want to be left to yourself. Now you want to contemplate. So in the scriptures, permit. So okay, now you have the permission. It's granted to you to become a renunciate. This second stage of life, <coughs> called life of contemplation, where there is a total devotion to the pursuit of knowledge. So now you go to the teacher in the olden days. These days teachers come to us so we don't have to go with those days. The knowledge would only be available with the teacher. So you must go to the teacher, live with the teacher, sit at the feet of the teacher and study and contemplate. So there the only thing they will do is this, Adhyatma Jnana steadfast in pursuit of knowledge. So what does it involve? Shravanam, Mananam, Nidhyasanam, Shravanam, listening from, from to the teacher. Teacher, unfold the scriptures. The subject of scripture is you, or self. In unfolding the scripture, the teacher is unfolding the self. Unfolding Brahman, unfolding the truth. So you listen, reflection, mananam, reflect upon what you listen to, so that it becomes clear. Niridhyasaram, assimilate. Today what happens is, Swamiji, when we are in the classroom, everything is very clear. As soon as we leave this room, then hey, the whole samsara comes back on my mind. Like somebody asked Ram Krishna Paramahansa, that they say that when you take a dip in the Ganges, all your sins get, uh, you know, uh, all the sins are gone. But we find that the fellow is the same. After taking dip in the Ganges, also he says, when you, when you, before you take the dip, you remove your clothes and put them, you know, on the bank of the river. Take a dip, all sins are gone. They all come and stick to your clothes. As soon as you put them on, they come back to you again. So it looks like everything comes back again. And 
we seem to have lost the advantage or the, this one doesn't seem to have an effect. Samsara has such a strong effect that whatever effect was created by studying and listening seems to disappear. So we have to make this effect stronger and stronger and stronger such that effect of samsara becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And that can be provided. We are dedicated to this. So Lord Krishna says, this is where Adhyatma Jnana Nityatvam steadfast in, steadfastness in pursuit of knowledge. So even today also, we need to set aside some time to become a renunciate. Not a full-time renunciate. You can become a renunciate half an hour a day, 45 minutes a day, whatever time is possible for you. At that time, all duties, all responsibilities, all engagements, everything given up, no telephone, nothing, for half an hour, 45 minutes. Here while doing puja also, telephones are right there, that keeps on ringing, and you know, so that has become such a companion. But for 45 minutes I will now say this. No more reports, no more meetings, nothing. So one becomes a renunciate at that time. And you bring back to your mind what it is that you listen to. So when we come to the class, it's a good idea to bring a notebook and pencil or pen. Jot down a few points. Something that has inspired me. Something that has given me a new insight. In every class we get something. You know, one or two new insights we get. Some clarity we get. And during that for half an hour or forty-five minutes, the time of meditation, bring back that. And then go over in your mind and see what it means to your life. So when you are in the class, when you listen to the class, it's in a general way it is saying, it's applicable to everybody. How does it apply to me? So this understanding that we gain in the classroom should be translated to our life so that it becomes our knowledge. And then we can apply it in our life. So there was set aside the time to do that, so that, and repeat, revolve that in the mind. Repeat that in the mind so that it creates an impression, an impression, an impression. So we want that slowly this creates a stronger impression than the impression that the world creates upon us. Therefore, even when you are pursuing a life of activity, it is possible to, it should be possible to set aside some time for this. So that, you see the time that you are spending now, hour and a half, is a very valuable time. And it should not be lost. Its effect should be retained. And for that, it is important that you should set aside some time for contemplation upon this, for reflection upon this, reflection upon this contemplation upon this. So call it reflection, contemplation, meditation. There are different kinds of meditation. But the one that we are talking about is, is something which is based on what you understood. Making it firm in the mind. Retaining that in the mind. Understanding what it means to me in my life. So that this also has an opportunity to create some impressions. So, Swami, in life of activity now, how can I pursue knowledge constantly? Then the values. Because Lord Krishna, in second line says, Eta jnana viti even this value, amanitvam, humility, freedom from pride, freedom from pretentiousness, freedom from violence, forgiveness, compassion, truthfulness, these values are all prescribed. Even living life of this value also is life of pursuit of knowledge. Because this value is a means of knowledge. So, 
in the life of activity while you are doing the activities. Let every activity that you perform become a become an occasion of practicing these values. So that way, Adhyatma Jnana Nityatvam, steadfastness in pursuit of knowledge. But Swami, why should I do this? I have many other things to do. Why should I pursue this knowledge? What is the big deal about that? What do I stand to gain? See, your mind always wants to know what is in it for me. <laughs> Otherwise, why should I spend my time, my energy? Why should I it requires an investment. Why should I invest? Any pursuit requires investment of time and energy. If not money, at least. So it's a very valuable resource that we have. Time and energy is very important to us. Why should I invest in this? So Lord Krishna says, second, Tattva Jnana Artha Darshanam. Keeping in view the purpose of the knowledge of the truth, Tattva Jnana. Tattva means truth. Tattva means truth, Brahman, Self, Ishvara. Tattva Jnanam, the knowledge of truth or knowledge of Self, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of Ishvara. Which is what we are discussing. Artha Darshanam. What purpose is to be served by gaining this knowledge? That should become, you know, we should spend time in reviewing that also. In understanding how this knowledge is the most important thing in my life. Why? Swamiji. That's what we've been discussing since last three days that the basic problem that human being has is the problem of sadness or sorrow or unhappiness. And we should recognize this as to what we are doing in our life. When we review what it is that we are doing in life, we will find that what all we do is dedicated to one of the two things. Sukha prapti either attainment of happiness or dukkha nivrutti, getting rid of unhappiness. Whatever we do, behind that the only purpose is either attainment of happiness or getting rid of unhappiness. There is no third thing. In fact, even they are two not different things. Attainment of happiness and getting unhappiness is the same thing. That's all we want in life. If I want to become a millionaire, not for becoming miserable. I want to become a doctor, not to become unhappy. Whatever I want, I want because I want to be a pleased self. Upanita says the only thing that is dear to us in our life is the pleased self. That's all we want. We are all self-centered people. The only thing we want is the pleased self. So we will find out that behind every pursuit, whether you acquire or whether you renounce, whether you act or you retire, in whatever you do, the only purpose is the Attainment of happiness. Attainment of pleased self. You want to be pleased. So the pleased self is the only pursuit in our life, nothing else. The pursuit behind all the pursuits, or the desire behind all the desires is the desire for a pleased self. So when it says, Atmanastu Kamaya Sarvam Priyam Bhavati, say Jagyamika says to Maitre, hey Maitre, Whatever is dear, is dear to me because it is a pleased self that is dear to me. So money becomes dear to me because I think that that is what gave me, create a pleased self. Wife is important, spouse is important, child is important. Why? Because I expect to be pleased to them. They are all, I look upon them all as a means of pleased self. So one cleric is required. 
that I am seeking only one thing in my life and that is the pleased self. Second clarity is that what can create that pleased self? Is it that some achievement in the world can create the pleased self? When am I pleased? When do I experience the pleased self? When I am happy? Happiness is a state of mind and not a state, external state. Meaning that I am happy not because I am in a given place or at a given time or because I achieved something, because I gained something, I lost something. Happiness is not the function of anything. It is the function of mind. When a mind becomes clearer of raga and dvesha, when the mind is clear of attachment and aversion, when the mind momentarily gains purity, that's when the happiness becomes revealed in the mind. Thus, the pleased self is experienced when the mind is clear. Like a pool of water from which all the dirt is removed and when the water surface becomes calm, how it becomes transparent and we can see through the water. So also, when the momentarily mind becomes transparent, all the anxiety is gone, Momentarily, all worries are gone, all problems are dropped off. There are moments, usually always we have on our mind. These problems and worries and anger never leave us. Moment comes. When I just happen to listen to my favorite song. So those days, there were only radios, you know, they were also new in our time. So all of a sudden my neighbor is playing a radio and I hear the tune, my favorite song, I run to my own radio to start it, you know. Because even just listening to the song just makes me so happy. Momentarily, all the worries, anxiety, everything gone. Mind becomes calm, becomes clear. That is where the happiness is experienced. So happiness is a function of the state of mind, not something outside of it. That song is just in, in, in instrumental in creating that mind. I was waiting for my result. I got first class. I'm happy. That is just an instrument or incidental to creating the state of mind. I got admission in engineering. <sighs> so happy. It's just incidental in creating state of mind. I got a visa for the United States. <sighs> incidental in creating that state of mind. Whatever happens out there, which we think is a source of happiness, is merely incidental in creating that state of mind. That incident can happen. If it doesn't create a state of mind, then it doesn't mean anything to us. I was trying a visa, you know, in US, once they rejected, second time rejected, third time, fourth time they gave me. I lost interest, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> So even that visa comes, it is of no use to me. Doesn't create that please mind. You understand? So whatever happens out there, which I look upon as something desirable, just creates, it becomes only an occasion or incidental in creating that state of mind. So please the self is discovered in a mind which is free from attachment and aversion. Raga and Vesha, anxieties and worries, which we call pure mind, sattvic mind, clear mind. So that mind becomes important. How do you get that mind? Amanitvam, adambitvam. So what are the impurities? Pride is an impurity. Therefore, humility becomes value. Violence is an impurity. Therefore, non-violence becomes value. Dishonest is impurity, therefore honesty becomes so. So all these twenty things that Lord Krishna has said, they become valuable to me because they are the direct means of creating a mind free from impurities. When the mind is from impurity, that is the experience of pleased self. Therefore, these values become important. <clears throat> So discovering the value of values, discovering value of knowledge, knowledge can take place when the mind is clear, pure, 
and mind can be pure provided these values are practiced. So ultimately most important is the self. Therefore, knowledge of self. Therefore, the mind in which the knowledge can take place is important. And these values which create that mind become important. So when I discover importance, that through this, what am I going to achieve? Limitless happiness. So that's the purpose of knowledge. So that's the purpose of purity of mind. So that's the purpose of values. When this is clear, then this becomes the most important thing. <coughs> See, the reason why we come and close our books and next day we open them again is because we have not discovered its great importance or value. However sincere we are, it is still not the most, Swami Ji, this is okay. But what about my son and what about my daughter and what about my job and what about my this and what about my bank account, etc. This is very important to me. Therefore, this poor thing doesn't get any. When Swami comes and they keep on making a phone call and say, okay, I'll come now. Because Swami will ask, how, where were you? How come I didn't see you? <laughs> Even that much is okay. But what I'm saying is that, we get motivated to do something provided it is the most important thing in our life. More important thing is, more motivated we are. We are all utilitarian people. So when you discover that this knowledge is the most important thing, because it gives me the happiness that I am seeking. And that knowledge can take place provided the mind enjoys that purity. And that can happen when I live a life of these values. Then the values become important. Then that mind becomes important. Then knowledge becomes important. Moksha is important. <coughs> so tattva jnana, constantly reminding, hey mind, what do you want? Mind says, I want to go to movie, I don't want to go to class. Then remind the mind, what do you want? You want moksha, you want happiness, is not so. Happiness is yourself. When you experience, when the mind is clear, pure. When do you get that? When you pursue these values, when you pursue the knowledge. So that is how knowledge becomes important to us. When you realize that, the knowledge is the means of attaining the happiness which I am seeking in my life. Nothing else can give me that happiness. Only one thing I give which is myself, the self-knowledge. So thus constantly reminding the mind about the value of this, so then knowledge becomes valuable. Then that mind conducive of knowledge becomes valuable. Then the values which create the mind become valuable. So therefore this also becomes a value. Finding the value of the values also becomes a value. Second line, Lord Krishna says, Eta jnana viti protam ajnanam idatonyata. Here, Arjuna, these values, amaritvam, meaning the humility. Adam bittam, started from the verse 7. Freedom from pretentiousness. Ahimsa, non violence. Shantihi, forgiveness or compassion. Arjavam, honesty, straightforwardness. This is called Jnanam, Lord Krishna says, this is also knowledge because they are the means of knowledge. These values create that mind which is the means of that knowledge. Therefore, in a second sense, these values also are called knowledge. Agnanam, yadatonyatha, opposite of that is ignorance. So whenever I practice humility, I am practicing knowledge. When I show pride, I am showing ignorance. When I practice non-violence, I am practicing knowledge. When I become violent, I am showing ignorance. Two choices, life of knowledge, life of ignorance. Life of viveka, aviveka. Discrimination, non-discrimination. Intelligent living, unintelligent living. 
So what is intelligent living? A living based on these values is intelligent living. Opposite of that, meaning submitting myself to anger, to jealousy, to greed, to, uh, to violence, to dishonesty, to corruption, all of this is life of ignorance. Ignorance means misery, knowledge means happiness. So we have a choice to a life of happiness or life of misery. So Lord Krishna says, this is called knowledge. The opposite of that is ignorance. <coughs> Having said that, now Lord Krishna comes to the again main topic of this chapter. Because remember earlier we said in second verse, first verse said, Hey Arjuna, what's the nature of self? Self is different from the non-self. This body, mind, sense complex is non-self. And who is the self? The one that is aware of that is a self, Atma. <coughs> Secondly, to say, here you want to understand that I am the self in all the embodiments. But what do you mean by I? Lord Krishna says, I am the self in all the beings. But Lord, what is your nature? So when Lord, I am the self, who is that I? What's the nature of Ishwara? What's the nature of God? So that now Lord Krishna starts describing here. So as a preface, the verse number 5 says to us, Nyeyam yattat pravakshyami Yajnyatva amruta mashnude Anadimat param brahma Nasattan nasa duchyade Kriyam yattat pravakshami Kiyajuna pravakshami I will clearly tell Gnayam that which is to be known. What is to be known? The Self is to be known. Ishwara is to be known. They are all different names. It is called Satyam, Gnanam, Anandam, Truth, Knowledge, Infinite. It is called Brahma, called Self, called Atma, called Ishwara. All of these are the different words used for the same principle. In different contexts, we use different words to denote the same principle. In some contexts, it is called truth. Sometimes it is called consciousness. Sometimes it is called existence. Sometimes it is called ananda or happiness. Sometimes it is called wholeness or fullness, puram. Sometimes it's called Brahma, sometimes it's called Bhuman. So in different contexts, different words are used by Upanishads to denote the same principle. Basically, what is that principle? Gnayam is to be known. So truth is to be known. Swamiji, I want to experience God. That is true. You want to experience God. So when I say I want to experience God, it presupposes that what I am experiencing now is not God. When somebody says I want to experience God, it presupposes that what I am experiencing now, this is not God's own. God is something, God is an entity having four arms with Shankha, Chakra, Gada, that's called God. Or when he comes before me with a flute in his hand, that's called God. Or the Father in heaven is called God, meaning that we have some idea of what God is and what is it that I want to experience. 
which is that's not nothing wrong. I don't say it is wrong, but this is what is right. Is Upanishad say that what is is God, meaning that whatever it is that experience is God. This is God's Swami. This walls are God. These people are God. These mosquitoes are God. These trees are God. This is, you know, this is God. Yes, as we say, one God who has manifest the Self in all these different forms. Like one ornament, one gold manifesting as variety of ornaments, different names and forms. Is it not so? Just because ornaments are many, does it mean that the gold is many? Swami, I see the banger, but I want to experience gold. This fellow says, banger I see, but I want to experience gold. The wave I see, but I want to experience water. So what do you do now? This fellow is looking at the banger and says, I want to experience gold. What should I do? No, this, I don't call this gold. When it comes in a particular form, then like I'm gold. Is it so? Whatever form is gold. Meaning that, understand that you're already experiencing gold to see the fact that what you're experiencing is gold. When you are experiencing Bengal, remember that you are experiencing gold. But because you think that you have some notion about what gold is, and therefore in Bengal you don't see, but then that this Bengal is nothing but the manifestation of gold. So Sarvam Khavidam Brahma, Upanishad says that all this is Brahman, all this is Ishvara. That's why Swami says, what is, is Ishvara. So ask you a question, how many gods do you have, Hindus, how many gods do you have? Oh, Rama is one god, Krishna is another god, Shiva is third god, Ganesha is fourth god, Anjana is a fifth, so many gods. So no, no, ekam said, vipraha, ahuda vadanti, god is one, the wise calling by different names. So god is one, all right. So, when our children are now confronting the people of other faith, because Hindus are the most ignorant of their religion, number one. If people, those who are most ignorant of Hinduism are Hindus, so-called Hindus. Not only ignorant, but having all wrong notions about Hinduism. Because nobody has taken time to study what Hinduism is. Say. Nobody has taken time. That's why we need to bring out this book. And there are many, <coughs> there are one of the millions of books in the Dharma. But anyway, to give some idea. But, so therefore, number one, see, we worship only one God, we are worshiping many gods. So we ridicule like that. It says, no, we are not worshiping many gods, we also worship one God. But more than that, we are worshipping not only one God, we are worshipping the only God. Sarvam Khalvidam Brahman, what all is is Brahman, what all is is God. Therefore, it is not God in heaven or someplace different from me. So when they say we worship one God, it is presupposed that, that God is different from you and God is different from the world. And what you see is not God, God is different from that. Upanishads says, no, Sarvam Khalvidam Brahma, what is is God. If that is so, then that means that whatever you are experiencing now is God. You will see that fact, you see. This is God, yes. See that fact, this, this chapter itself will say, then all the dissimilar, the one that is in all disparities or all dissimilarities, one that is similar. In many, one that is one. In the perishable, that is imperishable. See that, yes, pashyadi, sa pashyadi. One who sees that, sees it. 
So Vedanta invites us to see, meaning that understand what it is that we are experiencing. It is not necessary that we have to create a new experience to know God, but then we will see this fact that what we are experiencing is God. Gnayam. Therefore here, Brahman is described another word, Gnayam. That is to be known. That which is and which to be seen, which to be known. <clears throat> what I am experiencing is Bengal. See the fact that we are experiencing gold. That Bengal is nothing but gold. All there is in all the ornaments is just one gold. Gnayam yatta pravakshami. Here, Juna, I'll tell you now about Brahman or Ishvara, which is to be known as your very self. All right, Lord. Then what is the benefit of that knowledge? What's the reward? Yad jnātva amadha by knowing which you gain immortality. Immortality. Have you heard of immortality? Have you heard of ambrosia? See, we have the concept that there is heaven in which gods live and these gods are immortal. Why are they immortal? Because they partake of ambrosia, amrutam. So in heaven there is ambrosia. See, when they churn the milky ocean, then ultimately Lord appeared as Dhanvantari, with a part of ambrosia, and Devdas drank that ambrosia, so they became immortal. Immortal. What is immortal? Freedom from death. Even those devtas don't immortally pray because they also someday will die. Whoever is created will perish someday. Only what is not created will not perish. Immortality. Freedom from death. Freedom from ignorance. Freedom from sad, unhappy sorrow. Therefore, sat, chit, an, the same thing. Freedom from death, same as freedom from sorrow. Same as freedom from ignorance. Freedom from death is called what? Sat. Freedom from ignorance is called Chit. Freedom from sorrow is called Ananda. Sat Chit Ananda. Freedom from death, ignorance, sorrow. So by knowing which you get immortality. You get freedom from death. You get freedom from sorrow. You get freedom from mortality. You get freedom from ignorance. I am mean, not interested in that. I am interested, but that's what we are interested in. That's all we want is freedom. We, three things in life we do not want. Number one, nobody wants to die. I don't think anybody will volunteer to die. The death comes and snatches our life, that's a different matter. But we don't want to die. Mother well, Swami, there are many people committing suicide. They want to die. They also don't want to die. But then why did the person commit suicide? Because there is so much pain and misery, that person does not know how to become free from that pain or misery. Therefore, he wants to give up his life thinking that the pain will go. He wants freedom from pain, not from life actually, but doesn't know how else to do. Therefore, he ends his life. Basically, person wants freedom from pain. Nobody wants that. So freedom from death, freedom from pain, freedom from misery, freedom from sadness, freedom from ignorance is all that we want. That's called immortality. Call it moksha, call it liberation, call it immortality, call it freedom. Here Juna, Yajnatva Amrita Mashnute, knowing which one gains immortality, one gains moksha, one gains liberation. Meaning that one attains the purpose of life. One attains the success in the true sense. I will tell you about that. How is it? The second line of the verse says, Anar, that is Nyayam or Brahman. How is it? Anadivat param Brahma nasattan nasaduchyade. Anadivat, it is beginningless. Param Brahma is called Param Brahma, the Supreme Brahma, the Limitless. Nasat the Nasat is called neither Sat nor Asat. It is neither Sat nor Asat. Asat means existent. Asat means 
non-existent. Neither existent nor non-existent. Neither cause nor effect. Neither gross nor subtle. Meaning that it is that which cannot be described in any words. <coughs> no word is big enough really to describe it. So therefore, it is, we use the word Swami by using Brahman. The word Brahman also does not describe it. The word Atma also does not describe it. Then what? So, in Vedanta we use two expressions. Vachyartha and Lakshyartha. Vachyartha means little meaning. Lakshyartha means implied meaning. All these words, Brahman, Atma, Satyam, all the words, they indicate what the principle is. Not describe, but indicate. Meaning that we have to ultimately drop the literal meaning and see the implied meaning. I will tell you about that. <clears throat> so with that preface, Lord Krishna in the next verse describes what Ishvara is or what Brahman is. Sarvata Pani Padantata Sarvato Kshishiro Mukham Sarvata Shruti Maloke Sarvata Shruti Maloke Sarvama If you attended the Vedanta classes, then they keep telling you again and again, it cannot be described in words. It cannot be said with this or that, meaning that Brahman cannot be described as such and such. It is neither this nor that, nor described in words. You cannot say it is like this or it is like that. So sometimes it creates this doubt that is such a thing as Brahman that you say that it can't be described in words, it cannot be visualized by the mind, it is where the words of the mind all return. Is it there? What is the evidence that there is God? What is the evidence that there is sense self? What is the evidence that there is consciousness? Is it there? See, consciousness you cannot see. See, electricity we cannot experience. What do you experience? The effect of electricity. So whether electricity is there or not, how you know? You switch on the light. Oh, light is there. Electricity is there. The fan is functioning. Electricity is there. How do we determine that electricity is there? Current is there in India. Sir. There is current. Because we lose that often. That's the problem. In many places, we lose that electricity supply, you know, very often. And there were Better find out whether light is there or not. So it switches on. Mama, light is there because the bulb is glowing. Electric. How do you know electricity? You don't see. What do you see is the glowing bulb. What is the glow of the bulb? It is the effect of electricity, meaning that bulb could not glow unless electricity is there. <laughs> bulb itself is glowless, you know. Bulb itself is glowless, is it? What? It glows because of something else. Since bulb cannot glow on its own, when the bulb glows, we know that there is something because of which the bulb glows. And that is called electricity. The fan rotates, turns. Since fan cannot turn on its own, therefore when the fan turns, we know that there is something because of which the fan turns and that is electricity. So electricity is inferred. From the presence of the glowing bulb, you infer the presence of electricity. That electricity is there. What is the proof? That the bulb is glowing. Electricity is there. What is the proof? Fan is running. So also consciousness is there. What is the proof? Ishvara is there. 
Consciousness is there, Atma is there. What's the proof? The rule is that what is insentient or inert cannot function on its own unless it is presided over by consciousness. This body cannot have sentience on its own. Body is sentient only when it is presided over by consciousness. Otherwise, there cannot be sentience. Because we know when the consciousness departs from this body, body becomes what? Lifeless. Becomes insentient. Becomes motionless. Right now, the body is moving. Showing life, that is because something is there. What is there? Consciousness is there. Although when I'm saying this, I'm just making it a little too simple. I said consciousness is not there. The consciousness cannot not be there really. But what happens is, when you take the case of the fan, see when you switch on the light, switch it on, <coughs> you want to have an electricity, does not directly run the fan. Electricity first runs the motor. And motor in turn runs the blades. Suppose we remove the motor. Then outwardly the fan looks intact. You switch on also, electricity also is there, and still fan does not run. Why? Because the electricity first energizes the motor, which in turn energizes the blades. Similarly, here also, the consciousness first enlivens the subtle body, the subtle body enlivens the gross body, so that the sentiency that you see in this body is due to the subtle body, which again is enlivened because of consciousness. So whenever anything inert is found to have a motion, you know that some conscious entity must be present. A bus, for example, cannot run on its own. When you see a bus running on the road, you are sure that there must be a bus driver, without which bus cannot run. In the olden days, they did not have bus. They had a chariot. When a chariot is running, you know that horses must be there, without which chariot cannot run. Because chariot on itself is motionless. The nature of chariot is motionlessness, but when we see motion in a chariot, then we know that there must be a live entity presiding over that. So rule is that an inner thing cannot have motion unless it is imparted to that by a conscious entity. Like a chariot cannot have motion unless motion is imparted to it by a sentient a living entity such as a horse. A bus cannot have motion unless the motion is imparted by a conscious entity such as a driver. Swami, you don't know. There are driverless buses. <laughs> there are those trolleys, you know. There are those cars. Without, so there are, you see those cars and the real tracks without drivers. So now you will change your reasoning. <laughs> Here is something that is in motion without a human being being there. Swami, you don't need a human being. Sometimes computers are running all these trains. Now they are also talking about a driverless car, is it not so? It may become a reality after some time. So let us define this principle, that car which is by itself motionless is in motion, so your principle is that it must be presided over by a conscious being. We don't find a conscious being, you don't find it there, but somewhere it is there. No, it is computer, but computer is what? It is also brought into life by human being, ultimately. So human being is a conscious being, that consciousness is imparted to computer, that is imparted to the train, that's ultimately the motionless train is in motion 
because of because it is presided over by a conscious entity a general principle a general principle is that what is motionless by nature cannot display motion unless it is presided over by or it is impelled by a conscious entity <coughs> So body by nature is inert, lifeless, motionless. You are organs of perception. By themselves are made of matter. We study in Tattva Bodha that our organs of perception are all products of the Sattva aspect of five elements. Organs of action are the product of the rigid aspect of five elements. The mind is the product of Sattvas of five elements, meaning that our body, mind, sense organs, all of these are products of five elements. Gross or subtle. Elements are inert by themselves. Meaning that this body is matter. Sense organs are matter. Mind also is matter. But the mind displays consciousness. See, with the eyes you can see, that means eyes are acting as conscious entities. With the ears you can hear, means that the ears are acting as conscious entities. With the mind you can think, so mind also acting as conscious entities. So these unconscious things are displaying consciousness that shows that there must be a principle on account of which they are all displaying consciousness. That is the evidence of consciousness being there. Consciousness is not a property of the body. Consciousness is not a property of sense organs. Consciousness is not a property of mind. All of them are unconscious by nature. But we find that they are displaying consciousness. That shows that there must be a principle which is consciousness on account of which all these unconscious entities are displaying as though they are conscious. The fan is as though in motion because that motion is not on its own. If what provides motion to the fan goes away, fan has no freedom to move. If there is no electricity, fan cannot move. No electricity, bulb cannot glow. No consciousness, eyes cannot see. Mind cannot think. You know when that happens? Even in deep sleep also, the consciousness is for that time withdrawn from the gross body, from sense organs, from the mind. Consciousness doesn't go away, it is withdrawn. Where is withdrawn? It is the very cause. Therefore, the consciousness at that time is as though not available to the sense organs, to the mind. Therefore, mind does not function. So eyes do not see. Yes, do not hear when you are sleeping. So thief comes and takes away everything and you don't even know. Because at that time ears are not hearing. Even skin does not touch. Mosquitoes have a good time that time, you know. <laughs> when they are fast asleep. Some people are so fast asleep that no mosquitoes can disturb them. We get disturbed right away, but some people are pretty, they are very good in sleeping. Only in the morning you find out there are so many blood spots and that, so, so many mosquitoes you kill. But then you are not aware that a mosquito was actually stung you. Meaning that even the sense of touch is not functioning because consciousness is withdrawn. When you wake up, you provide consciousness to all of this. They become conscious. The idea is that, that the body is functioning, that sense organs are functioning. So the mind is functioning, there is still the proof that there is consciousness. Because it's an indirect proof. We cannot directly experience consciousness. Just as we cannot directly see electricity, that we will infer the electricity from the glowing bulb. So also, since we cannot directly experience consciousness, therefore we demonstrate the existence of consciousness through this evidence that look, the body is sentient. See, the sense organs are sentient. The mind is sentient. Therefore, in Kyanopanishad, 
the, the aspirant comes to the teacher and asks, what is it because of the mind functions? What is it because of which the eyes see? What is it because of which the ears hear? What is it because of this breath you know, it goes up and down? What is it? Why does this question arise? Because I know that the mind is matter, the sense organs are matter, even prana also is matter, and matter cannot have motion on its own. So what is that imparts? It's sentiency. It's a it is the ear of the ear, the eye of the eye, the mind of the mind, meaning the self because of which these things all function. Therefore, here Lord Krishna in this verse is giving us, so says in this verse, Sarvata Pani Padandada Sarvata Okshi Shirvamukham Sarvata Shruti Manloke Saramahavrutti Tishthati That Brahma is one who has hands and feet on all sides, meaning that who is manifesting through the activities of hands and feet. Sarvata Okshi Shirvamukham to the eyes that I see, head that the heads think, hands that the hands work, mouth that they speak. All of these activities display that there is something that imparts this energy, that sentiency, this consciousness, and that is the self that is present as consciousness in all the beings. But sometimes the question is, Swami, where is the proof that there is God? The people don't believe in God. I said, okay. Is the proof? What is the proof? Did you talk? Did you think? Now what happens? Science doesn't accept this. This they will accept this is the proof, you know, by the way. You accept it because they're all believers and you have all Shraddha and the Swami and so you're all devotees. Therefore, you accept this approval. They won't accept it. You know what a scientist say? He says speech talks on its own. Consciousness is a property of speech. We say that speech functions because of consciousness. What will he say? Consciousness is the property of speech. Now, how do you just refute him? This consciousness is the property of the body. Consciousness is the property of mind. So they say that the consciousness is the body manifests consciousness. The mind manifests consciousness. Matter manifests consciousness. Consciousness is not different from matter. Matter is the main principle. Consciousness is the attribute. What do we say? Consciousness is the main principle, matter is the attribute. <clears throat> no, you, even he cannot refute this, by the way. Mm-hmm. What a scientist says? That matter is the primary principle and consciousness is the property of matter. When matter combines in a certain way, then it displays consciousness. Even we had materialists in our different schools of thought called charvakas. They say the same thing. That the body is made of four elements. When the four elements combine in a certain way, then consciousness manifests. What is death? When the combination changes, there is no more consciousness. The scientist will say. So now there is one view which says consciousness is the property of matter. What is our view? Matter is the property of consciousness. Understand the difference? Now, scientists will, you prove that matter is property of, I say, you prove that consciousness is property of matter. It is just taken for granted. All this whole science is based on simply the assumption that one point in time there is no consciousness. That there was the primordial soup in which there was the right temperature, right, and that's how consciousness evolved. So the consciousness is created. So in our brain also, some chemical reactions happen, they create consciousness. Therefore, brain dead. When brain does not do that chemical stuff, there's no consciousness. So there's no life. 
It is all right as far as your day-to-day -day activity is concerned. It's not all right as far as the basic principle is concerned. If basic principle is matter, then universe search for consciousness. Basic principle is consciousness, which manifests as matter. Now science also tells us that it is energy that manifests as matter. That much they will say, isn't it? Energy, what is matter? Matter is nothing but the waves or vibrations of energy. Then what is energy? We will say the vibration of consciousness. So consciousness first manifests as energy and energy manifests as matter. So then the matter is, is evidence that consciousness is. So the matter shows sentiency so that consciousness is. So for us, all that there is, it need not be even in motion. There something is. The table is. Is the evidence of existence because without existence, table cannot be. So existence is not the property of table. Table is manifestation of existence. You see the difference? He will say that table possesses existence. We say, no, existence manifests as table. <clears throat> existence the same as consciousness. Satyam, Dhyanam, Anantam. Sat, Chit, Ananda. What is Sat is existence. Chit is consciousness. Ananda is fullness, happiness, love. So that table is is the evidence that consciousness, I mean, existence is. Then you see the table, evidence that consciousness is. The table is dear to you, shows that there is ananda is. So, asti, bhati, priyam, sat, chit, ananda, is Brahman, is Ishvara, alone manifests in all the living beings, in all living and non-living beings. But here living beings are shown here that the, the beings live, that they see, that they hear, that they act, that they walk, that all the activities are there. That shows that there is this principle called Satchit Ananda, called Asti Bhadi Priyam, in prison of which all these become alive and they manifest life or consciousness. So life is manifestation of consciousness. But whether life is there or not, but Swamiji, you say that life is manifested of consciousness. But what about table? Doesn't have life. Is there consciousness in table? See this flower. This flower has five aspects. One is flower is. Right? What makes you say flower is? Because you are conscious of flower. Is there flower in my hand? No, because you are not conscious of flower in my hand. Is there flower here? Yes, because you are conscious of flower. You could not be conscious of flower if flower is not there. You could not say flower is if you are not conscious of that. So flower is, you are conscious of flower, both of them go together. Because you are conscious, so you say is. Because it is, therefore you are conscious. Flower, asti, it is. Bhati, it shines in your consciousness. Sir, flower is very dear to me. Priyam, and only happiness is dear to me. Therefore, there is exist, flower displays existence. Flower displays intelligence of consciousness. Flower displays happiness, wholeness. So also clock, so also table. Asti, bhati, priyam, sat, chit, anam. So, that Satchit Ananda is, Asti Bhani Priyam is, existence, intelligence, wholeness is, because, and that is why everything is. Not that because table is there for existence is, existence is there for table is. How do you prove that? You prove the other way around. So, scientists only go by their perception. We go by the scripture, that's the only difference. For us, Upanishad is the means of knowledge, Pramana. 
Upanishad says the fundamental principle is asti bhati priyam satyam jnanam anantam brahma. Existence, intelligence or consciousness is the fundamental principle. The whole universe is manifestation. Sanction or insanction. Therefore, with reference sentient beings, Lord Krishna says that all the beings have hands and legs and eyes and ears that shows that there is this principle called the consciousness. So, consciousness is, existence is, fullness is, Ishvara is, Brahman is. The next question is, can you separate the flower from existence? Flower is existent. Can you separate flower from existence? Or consciousness? Asti bhadi brahm, you cannot. Can you separate ornament from gold? There is no ornament. Can you separate wave from the water? There is no wave. Similarly, there is no flower if there is no asti bhadi. Flower cannot be without asti bhadi. One asti bhadi priyam manifests flower. Same as Tivadi Priyam, manifest as cloth. Same as Tivadi Priyam, manifest as table, as chair, as you, I, as mosquito, whatever it is. So whatever it is, is manifestation of one Asti Bhati Priyam. Satchit Ananda. You call it Brahman, call it self. So what is, is what? Asti Bhati Priyam. Is it not so? What is table? Asti Bhati Priyam. In that name and form. What is flower? Asti Bhadi Prem. In that name and form, what is you? Asti Bhadi Prem. In that name and form, what am I? Asti Bhadi Prem. In this name and form, whatever is, is what? Asti Bhadi Prem. In that name and form. What is who is a friend? Asti Bhadi Prem. In that form. Who is an enemy? Asti Bhadi Prem. In that form. Who is a saint? Asti Bhadi Prem. In that form. Who is a sinner? Asti Bhadi Prem. In that form. Who is good, bad, indifferent, right, wrong, whatever it is, asti, bhati, priyam, in that form. What does it matter what the form is? I want to experience God. Remember that. What is experience? Asti, bhati, priyam, is experiencing. And where is that? That's your own self. Therefore, what you need to do is just drop name and form. For that you require a capacity called mind, for that you require purification. That's why amanitam is required, values are required. So you require a mind in which you can drop this. Right now I cannot drop it. No, this is my spouse, no, no, that's very dear to me. This is my son, this is my, I hate this. So this hatred and attachment is because of which I cannot drop this vesha, cannot drop this costume of name and form. And mind because free from the influence of that, I gain the capacity to let go of the name and form and remain as Asti Bhati Priyam. So you see that what I am is Asti Bhati Priyam. You see that what is is Asti Bhati Priyam. What is is Ishvara. What is is Brahman. You don't have to create Asti Bhati Priyam. You don't have to produce it. You don't have to make yourself Asti Bhati Priyam. That's what it is. Gnayam yattat pravakshami. Here, you know, I will tell you what that which is to be known, which is all that there is. <coughs> so that's very beautifully locked in this 13th chapter, is a fantastic chapter. It just give you a little glimpses of what is in there. But that's how Lord Krishna says that what is is Ishvara, what is is Brahman, what is Asti Bhati Priyam, Satchit Ananda. Existence, intelligence, happiness, wholeness, fullness. Whatever you like, wholeness, fullness, happiness, love, beauty, goodness, all the same thing. That's all there is. All there is is beautiful. All there is is love. All there is is goodness. Where is goodness, Swamiji? Look closely. Even if what appears as evil, just look closely. Oh, he is a, he's, he's a terrorist. He is a murderer. Okay. Look closely. 
Because murder or terrorist or criminal is not the reality about him. Criminal is only incidental. Because of ignorance, because of unintelligence. But if that is removed, you will find that that person also is basically only love and beauty. But that requires a mind. What mind? That can accommodate criminality also. I don't get shaken up because he's criminal. I can still accommodate him. I can still love, suppose, that person. I become so large-hearted that I can still accept him or love him, suppose. Then I can see that the same beauty in there. Right now, criminal, I dismiss from my mind. Sinner, dismiss from my mind. He is telling lie, dismiss from my mind. I dismiss those things. If I can't see, what is to be seen there? So what, is the, what mind do we need? Which doesn't dismiss anything. Which embraces everything. Which accommodates everything. That's his values. So we require a mind. All embracing mind. All accommodating mind. All loving mind. Such a mind that can even love your enemy. Can you imagine? That's what Christ taught, isn't it? Love your enemies. Pray for those who hate you. That's what is meant. And so, that's what Vedanta teaches. So, these values. So, that's the preparation for seeing what is. <coughs> I'm telling you about that name, something that is to be known as your own self. Yajnatva amudamashnude, knowing which you attain immortality. Meaning you attain fear. As you are existence. There is no death there. You are conscious. There is no ignorance there. You are infinite. There is no happiness, sorrow there. You are already free from sorrow, free from death, free from ignorance. That's what you already are. See that fact. Therefore, knowing. That's why Vedanta talks about knowledge means seeing what is. Seeing in your mind's eye, of course. Eyes will continue to see all this variety and diversity. But the mind will see just as for a, a goldsmith. The eyes see many ornaments. The mind sees one gold. So also a Vedanta's eyes will see all this. Mind will see oneself. That kind of mind you have to cultivate for which these values are there, for which the karma yoga is there, for which prayers are there, There's all of these things are very important in order to acquire that mind. And this study is there, this contemplation, all of this contributes. And therefore, we can, you can meditate when the mind is at peace, when it is free from all demands, from all preoccupations, when you leisure, that time you can, in your mind, see that what is his existence? What is the steep body? Name and form are just vehicles. Name and banger is a vehicle for manifestation of gold. So all these names and forms are costumes. Vehicles, what is manifest is one asti bhadi, one satchidananda, one self. So there are moments when you do acquire, get that mind, then you have nice rest in the mind. That's why the morning time is recommended when the mind is at peace. Then we can take this verse and contemplate upon that and see what the verse says. So that's the kind of meditation that Vedanta prescribes. Meditation based on this teaching. And so that's called Nididhyasana, a kind of meditation which is based on this teaching. Okay, we'll continue. <coughs> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyade Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyade Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru So tomorrow we'll conclude this next